Okay then guys, so first of all thank you for all your positive messages regarding the videos. You obviously find them very useful. So I'd like to carry on with the videos for B1. We're going to start in this video, we're going to start by looking at B1 topic 2. So we're going to cover homeostasis, sensitivity in terms of nerve cells and we're also going to cover the reflex arc. Okay, so let's make a start. Homeostasis, so homeostasis. Now homeostasis, as I said in the previous video, if anything has home or homo in it, it means the same, to keep the same. So homeostasis is defined as the maintenance or keeping the same. So the maintenance, maintenance of internal conditions okay now there's various things that your body maintains there's various things that your body keeps the same uh, involuntary so you don't have to think about it it just sort of happens okay some of these things include and the ones you certainly need to know about are temperature so you maintain your temperature, you maintain your water balance, so water levels, you maintain your blood sugar, if I can spell blood sugar, and you also maintain other things such as blood pH, um, such as uh, off the top of my head now that'll do so temperature water levels blood sugar levels uh, blood pH things like that okay you need to know about these in uh, sync you need to know about each one of these and how they're maintained for Ed Excel okay so if we start with temperature okay if we start with temperature so your normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, okay? So if we start with a normal body temperature, body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, okay? Your body temperature should be round about 37 degrees Celsius. The reason you need it to be round about 37 degrees Celsius is so that reactions can take place. It's so that if it gets too hot, enzymes will denature. If it gets too cold, there won't be enough kinetic energy for enzymes to work correctly, okay? So we can add underneath here in brackets, so enzymes work correctly okay so we need to be round about 37 degrees so that enzymes work correctly we don't want it too hot we don't want it too cold okay now there's a part of your body that regulates your body temperature and that part of your body is known as the hypothalamus Okay, the hypothalamus. So if I write it down here, hypothalamus. This is the part of your brain. So the part of brain that regulates. body temperature okay so the hypothalamus is the part of your brain that regulates your body temperature now we know obviously those of you that have seen me teach know that I get very hot when I teach and I start to sweat so there are times when our body temperature deviates from this 37 degrees there are times when we get too hot or we get too cold okay so we could say if the body temperature rises above 37 degrees and we could say there are points when your body temperature drops below 37 degrees 
So drops below 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now you have certain homeostatic mechanisms that correct these. Okay. Your body wants to keep your body temperature at 37 degrees. So if your blood rises above 37 degrees, that blood flows through your brain, through the hypothalamus, and then your hypothalamus tells your body to do certain things. If your body temperature drops below 37 degrees, your blood becomes cooler than 37 degrees. As that flows through the hypothalamus, that recognizes that your, blood, your body temperature has dropped below 37 degrees, and then it does certain things to try and warm you up. Okay? So we can say, we can say, blood flows through hypothalamus, hypothalamus, and again here, your blood flows through hypothalamus and it's the hypothalamus that detects this change in your body temperature like so okay so your body temperature should be 37 degrees for your enzymes if your blood rises or your body temperature rises above 37 degrees your blood becomes hotter it becomes about 37 degrees that blood flows through the hypothalamus which is the part of your brain that regulates body temperature and if you get too hot in order to cool down you will do things like sweat okay You'll do things like sweat and the hairs on your arms will lay flat. So this will cause you to sweat. Your body hairs lay flat. And it causes something called vasodilation. Vaso dilation which we'll talk about in a moment okay if your body does these things what will happen is you will return to normal body temperature so you'll end up having normal body temperature of 37 degrees okay so what's happened is your body temperature has got too hot, it's gone above 37 degrees, therefore your blood is above 37 degrees. This flows through the hypothalamus in your brain. That Then the hypothalamus in your brain says, hang on a minute, the body's getting too hot, we don't want these enzymes to denature. So what it does is it tells your body to sweat, it tells the hairs on your body to lay flat, and it tells your blood vessels near your skin to dilate, to vaso dilight again we're going to go over this in a moment okay so i'll underline that so that we remember okay i'm going to go over vasodilation in a moment i might also go over body hairs on the other hand if your body temperature drops below 37 degrees your hypothalamus recognizes this and then it tells your body to do other things what happens is instead of sweating you shiver it causes your muscles to contract really fast and create heat. Your body hairs stand on end. So body hairs, body hair stands up. And instead of vasodilation, we have something called vasoconstriction, which I will go over in a minute. Okay, now by doing all these things, your body temperature can return back to 37 degrees. Okay, so if your body temperature goes above 37 degrees, that blood, the hot blood flows through your hypothalamus in your brain, 
The hypothalamus then tells your body to sweat, it tells your body hairs to lie flat, and it tells your blood vessels to vasodilate, which then drops your temp blood temperature. So we'll write that down. Uh, what color? So this tells you to drop your uh, body temperature these things cause your body temperature to drop whereas shivering your body hair standing up and vasoconstriction causes your body temperature to rise so your body temperature to rise okay so what we've got here is the homeostatic mechanism in which your body temperature is maintained so homeostasis is the maintenance of internal conditions one of those is temperature your body temperature should be 37 degrees celsius so that enzymes can work properly if your body temperature gets too hot these enzymes can become denatured which will stop them working altogether so the blood that is above 37 degrees celsius flows through your hypothalamus your hypothalamus tells your body that you are getting too hot and therefore you sweat your body hairs lie flat and vasodilation takes place these things cause your body temperature to drop down back to 37 degrees if your body temperature gets too cold there's not enough energy for your enzymes to work they get too cold and they start moving very very slowly this when this happens your blood becomes cold and flows through your hypothalamus as the blood flows through your hypothalamus this causes you, you this tells your brain that you are cold and the hypothalamus tells your body to shiver it tells your body hairs to stand up and it causes something called vasoconstriction okay this causes your body temperature to rise and that takes you back to a normal body temperature of 37 degrees celsius okay now what i am interested in and what you certainly need to be able to do for the higher grades is you need to be able to explain how these things cause your body temperature to rise and you need to be able to explain how these things cause your body temperature to drop now these are very common questions and you need to make sure you understand why these either cool you down or warm you up so let's have a look at that let's clear the board no we don't want to save we need to make the board black again so you can actually see what i'm doing turn this off get the white out and what i'm going to do this time is i'm going to divide the board up okay so i'm going to put on one side to cool down and i'm going to put on this side to warm up so this is if you're too hot so if you're too hot and on this side we're going to have if you're too cold remember that these are both relative to 37 degrees celsius your body wants to maintain 37 degrees celsius that is your magic number okay so this is where you get to see my fantastic art skills as i'm sure you've all heard so if i want you to imagine your skin okay so i want you to imagine your skin if this is your skin We've got it on that side, and we've got it on this side. That's also your skin. Just for reference, so you know what I'm talking about, this is inside your body, and this is outside your body. Okay, so these parts at the top are the outside parts of your body these parts at the bottom are the inside parts of your body okay so if you're too hot the first thing you do is you sweat 
okay sweat is something that your body will do so you'll often see that you'll have a sweat gland that sort of looks like this okay and if you're too hot this sweat gland will produce water or sweat okay but sweat is essentially water in your body it's your body getting rid of the water now how the, for I, I star and grade A questions you need to be able to explain how this cools you down this water on your skin okay and in order for you to understand that you need to appreciate that heat is a form of energy okay so I'll write this down here to keyword heat is a form of energy so it's a form of energy okay when you sweat what happens is some of the heat from your body goes in to the water so this would be a heat energy okay as this heat energy goes into water the water or the sweat on your skin starts to evaporate okay so this water will begin to evaporate like so and as it evaporates it takes some of the heat energy away from your body okay so as that happens that cools you down so as sweat evaporates it removes heat energy okay at the same time as this the hairs on your skin will you be able to see this color so the hairs on your skin in fact they're not flat enough lay flat like so okay now the reason they lay flat like this is because air that is around us is a good insulator and air as it being a good insulator it will stop heat from leaving your body it will keep the heat under your skin so by laying flat the hairs do not trap much air between your skin and the outside world therefore heat can get away from your body quite easily so hairs lay flat so that they do not trap air which is a good insulator of heat okay so by laying flat it reduces the amount of air near your skin which then does not stop the heat leaving your body okay the final one is this idea of vasodilation vasodilation now vasodilation vasodilation is when blood vessels get wider so blood vessels get wider okay so if you have got normal blood vessels in your skin they may usually be about this thick okay but when you get hot what happens is your blood vessels get wider so they'll go from being that thick to say this thick okay now because your blood vessel has got wider because vasodilation has taken place 
the heat in your blood is closer to the surface of your skin. Therefore, the heat can get through the skin more and evaporate out into the air. Now, the important thing here is that the blood vessels do not get closer to the skin. So they do not get closer to skin. They stay where they are. They're usually here. The center of the blood vessel would still be here. But they get wider. They get thicker. So the blood vessel flows, the blood flows closer to the environment. Therefore, the heat can evaporate. Okay. Now, if we take all these principles and we have a look at when you need to warm up, if you're too cold, the opposite happens. So, for example, your sweat glands no longer work. You no longer sweat. Okay? So, you no longer sweat because you don't want to get rid of any water. You don't want evaporation to take place. There's no more sweating taking place. So, there's no water on the skin. Your hairs on your skin stand on end. So they'll stand up straight. If you are cold, your hairs will stand up straight. So hairs stand up to trap air near the skin. And remember, air is a good insulator okay so air is a good insulator and what that means is it stops the heat from leaving your body okay so it's stopping heat leaving so it traps the heat in your body, okay? Now, before we had vasodilation, whereas this time you have something called vasoconstriction, where instead of getting wider, they get narrower. So vasoconstriction is where the blood vessels get narrower. So blood vessels get narrower. And this prevents the blood flowing as close to the skin. Therefore, the heat in your blood does not get lost to the environment. It stays within your body. The final one that you do is that when you are cold, you shiver. Now, what a shiver is, is a muscle contraction. Your muscles contract really, really quickly. Okay? And as they contract, they produce heat, which is kept in your body. So, these are the different ways in which your body maintains your temperature at 37 degrees Celsius. If you're too hot, what your body does is sweat comes out of the sweat glands, it evaporates and takes away heat energy with it. Your hairs lay flat, so they do not trap any air near your skin. And your blood vessels vasodilate, which allows the blood to flow closer to the skin and therefore lose heat to the environment. If you're too cold, your hairs stand on end. This traps air near your skin, therefore not losing much heat. Your sweat glands stop releasing water. You shiver, which is muscle contraction, creating heat inside your body. And your blood vessels vasoconstrict. They get narrower, stopping the blood from flowing close to the surface. Let's quickly have a look at the same principle with water, okay? So let's wipe the board, have a look at water, and then I will give you an exam, well, not an exam question, but some questions to do. 
um, as we have done in the previous video, which you all liked, okay? Now, Osmo regulation. Osmo regulation. In biology, anything that says Osmo is to do with water, okay? So, Osmo regulation is uh, the regulation of water levels in the body okay so in your body you need normal levels of water so we can start with normal water levels okay so these are your normal water levels now you can get to a point where you can have too much water or too little water so you can either have too much water in your body you've probably seen me walking around the school with my big water bottle and that's why i'm constantly going to the toilet because i drink loads of water in a day or you can have too little water okay now water is essential for chemical reactions okay reactions in your body so water is needed oh, is needed for reactions and when you get to a level if you any of you decide to do a level biology you'll see that hydrolysis and condensation reactions are really important but obviously you'll do more about that when you actually pass your GCSEs and get to A level so by to get too much water in your body this can come from food and it can come from water okay if you eat too much food or you drink too much water you gain water in your body you can lose water lose lots of water through sweating if you're too hot you can lose it through breathing you lose water when you breathe and you can use it in your way when you urinate okay so these are different ways in which you can lose water okay now again it's your brain that detects these things okay so your brain detects too much water or it detects too little water so your brain detects too little water okay so what your body will do is obviously if you have got too much water in your body you'll start to sweat and you'll start to urinate more okay if you've got too little water you'll become thirsty okay and a lot of the times you'll get headaches so if you get too much water you urinate a lot you sweat a lot and if you've got too little water you won't urinate much so what will actually happen is you'll have strong smelling wee and it'll be brown so strong urine and you'll feel sluggish feel tired because you won't have this water to do the chemical reactions you need so you'll feel tired okay or as well you'll feel thirsty which is the main one you'll literally really need a drink when you do these so if you urinate a lot if you've got too much water if you sweat a lot if you've got too much water if you have this strong urine and you get thirsty 
okay you drink lots of water this will take you back to normal water levels okay this is a form of homeostasis known as osmoregulation so you need normal water levels in your body for reactions if you get too much water from too much food or too much drink or your brain will detect that you've got too much water it'll tell you that you need to urinate all the while and you'll sweat more and then that'll take you back down to normal water levels on the other hand if you sweat a lot or you breathe a lot through exercise or you urinate a lot you'll have too little water this will force your brain to detect that you've got too little water and then you'll have strong urine you'll feel tired and your body will tell you that you're thirsty this will cause you to drink and when you drink it takes you back to normal water levels okay so let's have a quick look at how this translates into exam questions okay and I've prepared some questions for you as I did prior so if we have a look some questions here for you to do if you want to have a go at these questions pause the video either discuss it with someone next here or write it down on a piece of paper and then in a moment you can start the video again and I'll explain the answers okay I'll give you a couple of minutes off you go. Okay, so hopefully you've paused the video there and you've had a go at those questions. So let's have a look. Our first two questions, which are here, are target grade D to B. Okay, so the first one says, Explain why it is important for the enzymes in our bodies that our internal temperature is fairly constant. Okay, can I point out that internal maintaining it, our internal temperature is known as thermoregulation. Okay, much like osmoregulation, but it's called thermoregulation. So this is a two-mark question. It wants you to explain why it's important for the enzymes to have a fairly uh, constant temperature. So you should have said that enzymes work best at a particular temperature. That would give you one mark. So in our, our bodies, the enzymes work best at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. For your second mark, you needed to say that at a higher or lower temperature than that perfect temperature, enzymes will not work as well. Therefore, they do not work and we can't have the chemical reactions we need. Okay. So first mark, enzymes work best at a certain temperature. Second mark, if it's either too hot or too cold, they will no longer work properly. Second question, a pale skinned person may look pink after exercise. Part A, identify what causes this change. So as I said to you earlier, the blood vessels do not move closer to the skin. What you needed to say here simply is that vasodilation has taken place when someone looks pink their blood vessels have dilated they've got bigger and therefore the blood is flowing close to the skin but the blood vessels have not moved closer to the skin it is simply because of vasodilation part b says describe and explain what effect this has on body temperature now this is two marks they want you to both describe and explain so if you said that this causes heat to be lost from the body that would give you one mark because you've described the vasodilation causes heat to be lost from the body your second mark for the explain would be that the closer they the blood flows to the skin the easier it is to flow out to the environment okay so describe is that it would reduce the blood temperature explain is that the heat would find it easier to leave the body and go into the surrounding environment question three the final one describe osmoregulation in terms of a negative feedback system okay in terms of a negative feedback system 
Now, that is a key word that we haven't really mentioned yet. Okay? So, negative feedback systems. So, a negative feedback system is simply defined as mechanisms so mechanisms in our body that respond to change to bring conditions back to normal. Okay? So, for example, thermoregulation and osmoregulation are two examples of negative feedback. If our body temperature is usually 37 degrees Celsius, if we get too hot, what happens is we sweat, hairs lie flat, so I'll just put hairs lie flat, and we get vasodilation. That will then bring us back to 37 degrees Celsius. If we get too cold, then we shiver. We have our hairs stand up and we have vasoconstriction. Okay, we've just gone over all this and that brings you back to 37 degrees Celsius. These are examples of negative feedback. You know you should be 37 degrees Celsius. The hypothalamus detects that you're too hot, so it tells this to happen and it goes back to normal. Again, if it drops below 37, the hypothalamus picks up that you're too cold. These happen and you go back to 37. So if we have a look back at the question, It says, describe osmoregulation in terms of a negative feedback system. Three marks, okay? Three marks. So, if I have a look at the mark scheme with you and we go over it, you needed to say that if there's too much water in the body, that means that there's more water than the person is getting rid of in their wee, okay? Or more than what they're getting rid of. If there's not enough water in the body, then that means that water is being gotten rid of quicker than you're taking water in. Therefore, your body does certain things. If you've lost too much water, it makes you thirsty, so you have a drink. If you've got too much water, you wee a lot and sweat to take you back to normal water levels. So you get one mark for saying, if you have too much water in your body, you sweat or you weigh a lot. You get another mark for saying, if you don't have enough water in your body, you become very thirsty, and therefore you have a drink. And your third mark comes from saying that if you do those things, your water levels will return to normal, to the optimum conditions. That would be your grade A question, okay? This sort of thing would be for grade A. So, that's homeostasis done. Let's take a look at sensitivity. Okay? So if we wipe the board off, turn it back to black, as Amy Winehouse would say. I've used that joke before, haven't I? So we need to take a look now at your central nervous system. Okay, the central nervous system. So your central nervous system. Okay. Now your central nervous system essentially consists of your brain. There's my lovely drawing of a brain. Obviously mine's a lot bigger than that, but let I don't want to intimidate any of you. It consists of your brain. You also have a large 
set of nerves running down your spine. This is known as your spinal cord. Okay. Can I point out that your spinal cord is not your spine, it's not your backbone. Okay. So we've got the spinal cord, which is a large part, uh, a large bundle of nervous tissue which connects to your brain. And then connected to these, you have various sense organs, okay? Sense organs. Sense organs. Now, what sense organs are, are parts of the body. So, parts of the body that detect stimuli stimuli okay now a stimuli is simply defined so a stimuli is simply defined as a change in your environment okay so a stimuli is a change in the environment okay now please 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 make sure you know what a stimuli is the amount of pupils in all of my teaching career that cannot use the word stimuli correctly is silly in fact it's too damn high okay now this let loses so many people so many marks so please make sure you understand what a stimuli is. So, so, you have five senses, okay? So there's five senses. You have sight, you have hearing, you have taste, you have, so we've got sight, hearing, taste, touch, and you have smell, okay? Now, these are the five senses that your central nervous system detects, okay? So, for example, with sight, you have eyes, which would be roughly there on your body, that detect light, okay? So when light goes into your eyes, obviously light isn't bent, it's only in straight lines, but when light goes into your eyes, the light is the stimulus, and the sense organ is picking up the light that allows you to see, okay? So we've got light, the sense organ is your eyes, and the stimulus is light. So when there's a change in light in your environment, your eyes pick it up, and your brain detects it. Hearing, hearing is picked up, obviously, by your ears, okay? And I've got, as you're all aware, pretty horrible ears and I struggle to draw them okay but you've got ears and what they pick up is sound I don't mean you sound as a pound mate I mean that's the stimulus they pick up so you have ears ears that pick up sound so the stimulus would be sound okay you also have a, no, uh, a mouth which has a tongue in it, okay? So in order for me to be able to draw it properly, I'll draw the nose first, and then we'll have the mouth. Okay, we'll draw him smiling, because obviously this is biology and he needs to be happy, like so. Look at that, that's beautiful, that is. So for taste, you have a tongue it is your tongue 
that tests it, that detects it, sorry. So that is your tongue. Now your tongue picks up chemical signals. Chemical, okay? Now, sometimes you'll smell something horrible, be it a fart or whatever, and you'll go, oh, that's so bad, I can taste it. That is because smell and taste are both chemical signals. Okay, they are chemical stimuli. So, smell is picked up by your nose and it detects chemical stimuli. Your tongue picks up the chemical signal, uh, stimuli. So we can put chemical here, and that is picked up by your taste and your nose. The final one is touch, okay? And touch is picked up by your skin. And the one that people get confused with here is that the stimulus that they pick up is pressure pressure okay if you have pressure or you have heat it is usually picked up by your skin if you touch something it's the pressure of that thing pushing back that allows your central nervous system to pick it up okay so just to recap you have five senses Sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Each of these senses are picked up by sense organs. Your sense organs are eyes, ears, tongue, skin, and nose. Those sense organs pick up stimuli. And a stimuli is a change in the environment. Now, please make sure you know what a stimuli is. Please make sure that you use it in answers. The amount of pupils that do not use this word is silly and it loses so many marks. Okay? One that is usually a curveball is balance. Balance. Now, balance is picked up by your ears. Okay, your ears regulate your balance. This is why when you close your eyes, you know whether you're upright or whether you're lying down. So don't fall into the trap of, oh, balance is picked up by your eyes. It is not. Balance is picked up by your ears. This is why when you have an ear infection, you feel dizzy. Okay? So, 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 so. That's the central nervous system. So it consists of your brain and a spinal cord, attached to which are your eyes, ears, tongue, skin, and nose. When any of these stimuli activate these sense organs, it sends a message up your spinal cord to your brain so that your brain can make sense of it. Okay? So, let's have a look at neurons. Okay? neurons so a neuron a neuron is or a neuron is a nerve cell okay so that is a nerve cell and nerve cells have particular structures okay so any nerve cell it starts with a nucleus, a nucleus, okay, which is found within the cell body. So this would be your cell body, which contains a nucleus. Moving away from this cell body at one end, you will have something called dendrites, which spread out like so. So these would be dendrites. And spreading out the other way, you would have something known as axon endings. Like so. Okay. So these would be your axon 
endings. Now the reason these are called axon endings is because these long parts here are known as the axon. Something that's quite interesting is that a neuron run, a, a giraffe has a single neuron from the top of its head all the way down its neck. So there is one nerve cell in a giraffe's neck. And that is because these axons are so long. They run from the top of the giraffe's head all the way down to its body. Now that could be anywhere between what? Roughly eight, nine foot for one cell. Okay. Now, the dendrites are the part of the neuron that accept messages from receptor cells. Okay, receptor cells. So if this is a receptor cell, these are the things that collect stimuli from the environment. So receptor cells are cells which detect stimuli. So these detect stimuli from the environment. Now if you think back to what we just went over before I went over the structure of a neuron, these include sight, touch, taste, smell, and hearing. Okay? So it's these cells that detect this. What they then do is they pass an electrical stimulus, so an electrical stimulus to the dendrites. Okay? So this in blue, if we turn that off, this in blue is your electrical impulse. Okay? So the receptor cell sends an electrical impulse to the dendrites. There is lots of dendrites which collect things from receptor cells. So these dendrites can be connected to lots of different cells. So each dendrite gets an electrical impulse from each of the cells. This electrical impulse then travels up the axon, like so. Okay? And past the cell body and continues to travel to the axon endings. Once you get to the axon endings, these connect to other neurons. Okay? So what you would have here is another neuron. So it would be like so. I've done it in a different colour so you can appreciate where it comes from. So this would be the dendrites of the next neuron. So the dendrites of the next neuron. Okay? So the dendrites of the next neuron are attached. Well, they're, they meet the axon endings of the previous neuron. And the electrical impulse reaches the end of here, at which point the message crosses across as a chemical impulse. So here, between the gap, it will be chemical message. So that's important. Okay, a longer neuron, it is an electrical impulse. Between the axon endings of one neuron and the dendrites of the next, it is a chemical message. Okay, final part before I pass this on. Actually, no, it's not, not before I pass this on, a couple of other things. But next part to do with the structure of a neuron 
we need to think about something called myelin sheaths. Now, myelin sheaths are fatty pieces of tissue that are found on the axon of neurons. Okay? So these are your myelin sheaths. So myelin sheaths. And what they do is they speed up the electrical impulse. Okay? So myelin sheaths speed up speed up the electrical impulse along a neuron okay so what we've got here is we've got structure of a neuron. A neuron is a nerve cell. These connect to receptor cells, which detect stimuli from the environment. These stimuli can be sight, touch, taste, smell, or hearing. These send an electrical impulse to the neuron via the dendrites. This electrical impulse travels along the axon of the nerve cell until it reaches the axon endings, which then send the message to the dendrites of another neuron. And this will keep on happening from neuron to neuron to neuron until it gets to your brain, and your brain then sends a message. Okay? Now, there's three types of neuron you need to know about. Okay? The first of which is the sensory neuron. Now, the sensory neuron collects messages from the receptor cells okay so this neuron we've drawn here would be a receptor uh, a sensory neuron okay a re a relay neuron delivers the message from the sensory neuron to something called the motor neuron the motor neuron now the sensory neuron is what picks up the message from receptor cells the relay neuron passes the message from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron and the motor neuron is what sends the message from the brain to, or from the relay neuron sorry to the muscle so the muscle can contract so think of motor as in movement okay right then so let's have a look at what we've got so a worked example here explain how the structure of dendrons and uh, yep, dendrons and axons is related to their function of carrying nerve impulses so the person has said the long dendron carries the nerve impulse from the receptor cells the long axon carries the nerve impulse to other neurons the fatty myelin sheath insulates the neuron so that the electrical impulse is carried quickly to the end of the axon okay so it says here a point you will not get marks for saying that they carry messages you must always say nerve impulses or electrical impulses so what this is saying if we have a look at our board what this is saying is that the dendrites collect the message from the receptor cell the message is then passed electrically along the axon nerve impulses or electrical impulses to the axon endings and that then passes it on to another neuron okay so as it quite rightly says you won't get marks for just saying nerve impulses So, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause the video, please, and attempt these two questions. So, hopefully by now you've paused the video and you've had a go at 
these questions. So the first question, which is a grade D to C question, says compare the roles of the sensory, motor, and relay neurons of the central nervous system. You've got one mark for saying the sensory neuron carries electrical impulses from receptor cells to the central nervous system. One mark. Second mark, you need to say that the motor neurons carry nerve impulses from the central nervous system to effectors. But I will give you the mark if you have said muscles. We will talk about what an effector is in a moment. You've got your third mark for saying that relay neurons link the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. So one mark for saying the sensory neuron carries the messages from the receptor cell to the central nervous system. Second mark for saying that the re uh, motor neuron carries messages from the central nervous system to the effectors or muscle. Third mark for saying the relay neuron connects the sensory and motor neurons together. Second question. Explain how the structure of a sensory neuron is related to its function. So one mark for saying the long axon and dendrites of the sensory neuron mean the cell can collect impulses from lots of receptor cells. So long dendrites and an axon means that they can collect impulses from receptor cells. And your second mark comes from saying the myelin sheath insulates the axon and allows the message to be passed along much quicker. So, final part before we finish the video, okay, because this one's turned out to be quite a long one. What I would like to focus on is I would like to focus on this part here for a start. I would like to focus on the gap between two neurons, okay? So, Oh, no, I need to wipe the board first. Turn it back to black. We need green. So the first keyword is a synapse. Now, a synapse is a gap between two neurons. A gap between two neurons. Okay, so if we think of the dendrites and axon endings, so we've got the axon endings of one neuron. This is known as your presynaptic neuron. Your presynaptic neuron, so it's pre synapse before the gap after that you will have the dendrites of the next one like so okay this would be known as your post synaptic neuron okay if we were to zoom in on here, you need to know the structure of a synapse. So if I was to draw a box here, so you can see that this part is here and this part is here. So we're zooming in, okay? What you would actually have is you would have the presynaptic neuron, the axon ending of it. It looks like this. It's like a stick with a ball on. Okay. On the other side, you would have the postsynaptic neuron. And what this would look like is sort of like a shape like that. And then the dendrite going off that way, okay? Inside the presynaptic neuron, you would have something known as a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter, 
Okay, so these are neuro transmitter. Okay, now a neuro transmitter, if we define it, so a neuro transmitter is a chemical released by the presynaptic neuron or presynaptic neuron that sends a message to the post synaptic neuron. Okay? So this neurotransmitter is released into the synapse. This part here, this gap, is a synapse. Because as we can see, a synapse is a gap between two neurons. Neuron 1, the presynaptic one, and neuron 2, the postsynaptic one. And the neurotransmitter is released into the synapse. On the postsynaptic neuron, you will have receptors like so. Okay? Obviously, they're not this big, but for the sake of this video, we'll draw them this big. So we've had our neurotransmitter released into the synapse. And then what happens is these neurotransmitters go to the receptors. And when they attach to these receptors, like so, you get an electrical impulse sent along the post synaptic neuron okay so i did forget to add this at the beginning so we have an electrical impulse so our electrical impulse reaches the end of the presynaptic neuron it reaches the synapse when it reaches the end of the presynaptic neuron neurotransmitters are released into the synapse which then attach to receptors on the post synaptic neuron so these red things are receptors this causes an electrical impulse to be created in the post synaptic neuron and a message is sent down the dendrites okay now the important thing here and something that everybody always gets wrong so i'm going to put it in red is along neurons the message is electrical it's electrical but across synapses across synapses the message is chemical okay so a long neuron long neurons the message is electrical and across synapses the message is chemical so whenever you write about things like the reflex arc, which we're going to look at in a moment, you always need to mention that along neurons, the message is electrical, and between neurons, the message is chemical. Okay? So a synapse is a gap between two neurons. We always have a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. The electrical impulse comes to the end of the presynaptic neuron. This causes neurotransmitters to be released from the presynaptic neuron into the synapse, which is a gap between two neurons. 
these chemicals, these neurotransmitters, attach to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. This causes an electrical impulse to be made and passed down the dendrites. Okay? Final bit. Final bit, and then we can wrap this up because I'm getting tired now, if I'm honest. So, the reflex arc. Okay? A reflex action. Now, a reflex action is something that does not require your brain. You do not have to think very. Think about times when you put your hand on something hot. You pull it away dead quick. Think if you're crossing the road and a car comes speeding towards you. You jump out of the way. It's not a case of you thinking, oh, that car's about to run me over. I better jump out of the way. Or, oh, I can smell burning my hands on the hob of the cooker. It doesn't work like that. You have something called it reflexes, reflex actions. So this is a uh, movement or response to stimuli that does not does not involve the brain okay now this is because you need to be safe you need to make sure you don't damage yourself so reflex action and reflex actions stop us from getting hurt Okay, so for example, if I walk up to you in class and try to poke you in the eye, you'll pull your head away. You don't have to think, oh, I better pull my head away, Mr. Abraham's about to poke me in the eye. You just simply do it. You don't need your brain, okay? Now, there's a simple thing known as the reflex arc that you need to memorize, and we need to pull together all of the ideas we've spoken about in this video. This is known as the reflex arc, okay? Now, we will always start the reflex arc with a receptor cell, a receptor cell. Now, remember, these are the things that pick up stimuli from your environment, okay? These pick up, these are uh, things like your eyes, your skin, your taste in your tongue, smell, hearing, other things like that. These are receptor cells. These pick up an action. So, for example, if I've got my hand on the cooker, it is my skin, the receptor cells in my skin, that pick up the stimuli of heat. Okay? The first neuron that attaches to the receptor cell, if you remember, is the sensory neuron. Okay? So the sensory neuron picks up the message from the receptor cell, okay? So this is my sensory neuron. The sensory neuron connects to something called the relay neuron in my spine or in your spine or whoever's spine, okay? So this connects to the relay neuron just drawing like that because it's easier so the relay neuron now the relay neuron is in your spine so this is known as the relay neuron okay and it's in your spinal cord okay now, if you think back to earlier in the video, the relay neuron connects the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. Okay, the motor neuron. I'm running out of colours to use. Yeah. So, this connects it to the motor neuron. Now, remember, each time one neuron meets another, these are synapses. Okay, and we've just spoken how messages pass along synapses. So this is the motor neuron, okay? Then the motor neuron,
connects to something called an effector, an effector, or an effector cell. Okay, so this is the effector. Now, an effector is always a muscle or a gland. So the effector is always the muscle or the gland. The reason it's called an effector is because it has an effect on the body. So this is always a muscle or a gland. Okay? So these have an effect on the body. These bring about a response. So for example, the receptor cell in my skin will touch a hot hob. This will send an electrical impulse down the sensory neuron so it will send an electrical impulse down the sensory neuron so i'll put e dot i electrical impulse it gets to the synapse so this is a synapse which we spoke about earlier and it will send a chemical uh, message across using neurotransmitters this will then cause an electrical impulse in the relay neuron, which will then get to the end of its axon endings, where it will reach another synapse between these two neurons. And then that will be another chemical message. Okay. Once it passes this one, it will send an electrical impulse down to here. So this is your electrical impulse and then it will hit an effector where it will pull about a response so for example as i've tried to say about three times and i'll keep getting sidetracked if i was to touch a hot hob i would send the receptor cells in my skin would pick up that it's hot and they would say mr abram you're about to burn your hand that would send an electrical impulse down my sensory neuron to my synapse which would send the message to the relay neuron which is in my spine which would then send a message to a motor neuron which would send an electrical impulse to my effector which would be the muscles in my arm and I would then pull my hand away okay a gland a gland is something that releases hormones so think of when you have adrenaline okay if you are about to get into a fight or you get very angry you start to shake sometimes you might even cry this is because you release the hormone adrenaline and this is exactly the same idea except instead of the effect of being a muscle to bring about a response it is a gland that brings about a response so if we have a look at the final two parts worked example the diagram shows a reflex arc, identify structures A, B, and C. So A is the sensory neuron, is it? Yes, it's the sensory neuron, because that is what's connected to his skin or her skin. B is the relay neuron, because it connects the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. And C is the motor neuron, because then the bicep is the effector. The second question says, explain how this reflex helps survival. So he doesn't need to use his brain. He can pull his hand away very, very quickly so that he doesn't get burnt. Okay. Now, if you look here, examiner, make sure you follow the command word. For example, here it asks you to explain. That is very different to describe. So you'll need to use the word because. If explain is in there, you need to use the word because. So, final part of this video. Uh, pause the video and take a go at these questions. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Right then, hopefully you've paused these video, this video and had a go at the questions. The first question says, explain why the nervous system includes chemical neurotransmitters. Two marks. So, one mark for saying electrical impulses cannot cross synapses. They cannot cross the gaps between two neurons. That would give you one mark. Electrical impulses cannot cross neurons. Second mark comes from saying, therefore, 
chemical neurotransmitters are needed to cross the synapse and send messages on to the next neuron. So one mark for saying that electrical impulses cannot cross the synapse. Second mark for saying that neurotransmitters are needed to pass the message on to the next neuron. Question two says, explain how a reflex arc allows us to detect a stimuli and then respond. So you should have said, receptor cells respond to a stimulus by sending an electrical impulse to the sensory neuron, one mark. So receptor cells detect a stimulus and send electrical impulses to the sensory neuron. Second mark is that when the impulse reaches the sensory neuron, it sends a message to the relay neuron. When the message is sent down the sensory neuron, it passes the message on to the relay neuron. Third mark, the impulse is passed from the relay neuron to the motor neuron, which causes a response in the effector. The message is passed from the relay neuron to the motor neuron, which causes a response in the effector. So, that is B1, Topic 2, started. In the next video, we will have a look at this idea of glands and hormones, and then we only have Topic 3 left to do, and then B1 is done. Thank you for watching.